cow. And my voice is gone. Tell me, I have had problems with my voice. Never had this before. I'm, I mean, I'm so nervous about being up here that I think it's like psychosomatic. My voice is, if you can hear me and understand me, fine. If not, you're lucky that I don't have to go through all the pennants and World Series that the Yankees want to be here until next Wednesday. But I want to tell you, I want to congratulate Murphy with the golden tonsils. Uh, Lefty, whose record speaks for itself, and the Leo the Lip, who was my type of manager. The only thing was that <clears throat> he would get on me every once in a while in some of the World Series, and he'd like to find out something personal about you. Ted, this doesn't even sound like me. I can't. Anyway, DeRoche's favorite with me in the World Series was when I'd pop one up, he'd say, home run in an elevator shaft. <laughs> but he, he was a great man. And I'll tell you, the only reason that I'm here today, believe it or not, is because of you fans, my family, my relatives, and all my friends. <laughs> yeah. No, really, I think you put so much pressure on him, kept sending in those petitions and, and, and saying he should be in the Hall of Fame. And actually, my records pale with all these great Hall of Famers behind me. And that Huckleberry Lou Brock, he keeps calling me a rookie. I'm the oldest living rookie in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you talk about it taking a long time to get here, Steve. But anyway, I had to write a few things down because I, I really was dreading this speech. And I wrote down something that says, what baseball means to me. Now, I've been so lucky, with the help of the man upstairs and my family and friends, to be with the Yankees for 54 years with the same organization. And, and baseball has made it possible for me to support my family, send them through college, and meet people and go to places that we never would have had a chance to do. My, actually, my whole life up to this moment has been baseball. And it's flashing by me so quickly. I'm going to try and tell it as quickly as it's flashing by me. Because when I was a little kid in Brooklyn, uh, <laughs> No, I tell you, it was a great spot. Pee Wee knows all about that. But when I say all the people that really helped me, my high school coach, Al Kunitz, taught me how to bunt. Without knowing how to bunt, I'd have never made it to the big leagues. Paul Critchell, the Yankee scout, signed me after Stengel and Bill Terry told me I was too small to play baseball. And that was a big break for me. And my first two managers in the first two years was Ray White, who went to the same high school I did. And he took me over kids that were a lot better than I was. And you got to know somebody just like that. Bill Meyer, who was my manager at Kansas City for two years, was one of the great little managers. And he taught me a lot about baseball. The greatest manager I ever had was Joe McCarthy, old Mass Joe. But we had so many, I mean, these great World Series. We, I know I'm, this is typical of me. I, I start at the end and go back to the middle and then the beginning. And I really, I, I'm trying to get this down. When I, when I was a kid, playing in the streets of Brooklyn all those days, trying to, wanting to be a ball player, and if I had never been a ball player, I don't know what would have happened to me. A lot of nights, I'd wake up in a cold sweat thinking, had I not been a major league ball player, what would I have done for a living? Because everything I try to do turned bad. I try to run a snowblower, and I stuck my hand in and cut some of my fingers off. I mean, I can, I'm lucky I can turn on the, the car and know how it runs, and if I open the refrigerator and it's not right in front of me, I don't know what, what I'm looking for. I mean, it's, it's, it's really terrible. But when I talk about being a kid and playing on the streets of Brooklyn, I mean, we played everything that was possible, stickball, rackball, boxball, uh, paddleball. Uh, uh, Pee Wee never heard of any of these things, because he was shooting marbles down in Louisville. But these were great games, 
and it was great for our hand-eye coordination. So we broke a couple of windows, and my mother, God bless her, said, look, get a cover off a baseball. It was tough to get a baseball, number one, but we got one, cover broke off. She filled it full of rags, and we were able to play on the street, and you could throw curve balls, and I think that helped me as much as all the, sp the spring training and all the practice in the minor leagues. Now, uh, if people are understanding this speech, just raise your hand, or else you... <laughs> well, <laughs> my, I'm going to introduce... <laughs> My family knows me, so they raise their hands. But I'll never forget when the Yankees finally signed me to a contract, and they sent me to Bassett, Virginia in 1937. I had never been away from home. My father took a $20 bill and pinned it to my undershirt. He says, you got to watch out for those guys on the trains. And the Yankees gave me a nice seat, no sleeper, sat all the way to Bassett, Virginia. But it was a beautiful trip because we went through Washington, D.C., stopped in Richmond, Virginia, the first taste of southern fried chicken. I tell you, it was delicious. But they gave me, um, hey, White, what's that, what's that stuff that looks like oatmeal? <laughs> Grits. Grits. No. <laughs> they, no, they, <laughs> they gave me these grits. And I didn't know what to do with them. So I put them in my pocket. And I had no idea what, but anyway. Then we got to Bassett. Now Bassett was a town of 1,600, counting the cows. I got off the train and there was no town there. I'm looking around the mountains, just like your beautiful mountains. And then the train pulled away and there was the town. A little drugstore, a theater that was open, only open two days a week, and a drugstore. And that was the town of Bassett. The sheriff met me there, Sheriff Kuntz. I used to have breakfast with him every morning. And he took me to the boarding house where we stayed. And don't forget, I, I was making $75 a month at this time. Saving money, sending half of it home to my mother. In those days, oh, there's no sense talking about that. I mean, it, I mean uh, these... These kids today wouldn't remember that. But you could get a steak for 35 cents and all you could eat. But that was my, my and it, wait, one thing happened to me in Bassett. Uh, no, I, uh, listen, any time you want to leave, just leave, because this, this is, this is absolutely going nowhere. But, No, I, I stepped in what they call a gopher hole down there, going to first base. I didn't know what a gopher hole was, but I stepped, I hurt my leg, and I played on it for about two weeks, and the uh, manager and trainer, Ray White, used to pound my leg and rub it, which was the worst thing, as we found out. <laughs> and finally, after about 10 days, an old umpire who lived down there, had umpired in the major leagues, would umpire on weekends down there, he told Ray, you better take this kid to a hospital. They took me to Roanoke, Virginia, which was about 100 miles away. And little Dr. Johnson just felt my leg. He says, you need a, an operation immediately. What, how can I get a hold of your mother? Because I was underage and I had to get... He called my mother and said, I got to operate on your son. He operated on me and I had gangrene. Now, this is very unbelievable. If he hadn't been op operated on me, I'd only had one leg. Some way I would have found a way to play baseball with that one leg. But what I'm getting at is the, how lucky you have to be. I get one of these flies. And, no. But anyway, no, anyway. I woke up the next morning, and my mother was there, and my brother who's here today, Freddie, and he fainted from the smell of the ether. And, and was in the next bed. I didn't know where the hell I was when I woke up. And so, uh, anyway, he had to cut part of the muscle out of my leg because it was infected with gangrene. And actually, that was a break for me because I used to be so fast when I was a kid, I'd run by the ground balls, and this slowed me up just enough so that I could make the, <laughs> the ball.
I only got a couple of more of these. No, but uh, when, when I was in New York, at the time that I played for the Yankees, when I finally came up, I mean, it was, the, it was the universe, baseball universe. I mean, the Dodgers were there, the Giants were there, the Yankees were there. You could walk down any street in Brooklyn and New York and never miss an inning or a pitch. Somebody would have the radio on all the way down the block. And it was just, you know, it was just so great. The baseball was so great. The rivalry was so great with the Dodgers. The Giants just one year. But the rivalry with the Dodgers was really exceptional. It's unfortunate we'd beat them every year, but that one year that they, that one year they lucked out, we figured we better let them win one or they're going to leave town, and they left town anyway. Well, I want to tell you something. That we had, I mean, we had the best team, you, you know, and it wasn't that money could buy. In those days, we didn't make any money, but what a club we had. We'd win the pennant close to the 4th of July, and then we'd relax and just get in the World Series. And in those days, we made more money from the World Series checks than we did in our salary for the year. That was supposed to be a, a joke. <laughs> All right, anyway. When, when, you, when you've got a team, I mean, it went right down the line, too. When I joined the Yankees, they had Keller, Henrik, and DiMaggio in the outfield. Ralph at third, Gordon at second, Dickey behind the plate, Ruffing, Gomez, Murphy, Bonham, all those great pitchers. I mean, it was unbelievable. And I was just happened to be at the right spot at the right time. Sounds like I'm in Yankee Stadium with that echo coming back at me. But anyway, Frank Rossetti was just about ready to hang up his spikes. And I got in there, and all I had to do was make a few double plays, beat out a bunt. Rossetti taught me how to get hit with a pitch so it wouldn't hurt. All these little things, and I just collect that World Series check, and I, I mean, it was just so great. And my voice is starting, starting to go, but I, I, I would like to introduce my family before it, it does go on the blink, all right? And of course, number one is my pride and joy. I mean, and Steve mentioned the fact that baseball wives should get a medal every day for what they put up with when we're home and when we're on the road. And the groupies following us, and the... Or, not me! Uh, wait a minute, oh, no, no. No. But no, I, I want to tell you some of the things that Cora did for me. In 1946, after I came back from three years in the service, they started to throw crap, but couldn't hit a curveball. I came back and I figured my career is over. And then the Pasquale boys came up from Mexico, and they were flashing $10,000 bills around, and, they got Sternweiss and myself, put us in a Cadillac, went under the bridge by uh, the, the Yankee, Yankee Stadium, and they said, if you leave right now, we'll give each one of you $10,000, a new Cadillac, but you gotta go down there and call Mr. McCarthy from down in Mexico. So I went home and told Corey, I said, let's pack, let's go to Mexico. Well, we were gonna give it, get apartment buildings, we wouldn't have to pay taxes, which turned out to be wrong. I mean, the, but anyway, Cora says, if you go to Mexico, you go without me. I mean, but you know what she turned down at that? Don't forget, after the war, you couldn't get stockings, you couldn't get girdles, you couldn't get butter. She didn't need a girdle, I'll tell you that. She's pretty well built. But, <laughs> no, but, but that, I mean, that, I would have gone, but she, and, 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 uh, Lee, Larry McPhail had the Yankees that time. Lee is here today, his son. And Larry said they had bugged Pasquale's room. And they said, came to George and I and said, listen, we want you to testify against them because this way we can get them out. I said, I'm not going to testify. They want to give me more money. I mean, I was wrong. I mean, it was the wrong approach, I know, because he suspended George and I for a couple of days, but then they left, the Pasquale's left town, and, it came, and, and George and I got a raise after that. So that was one of the better things, many better things on my wife. Then another one, the other one was, it happened before this. See the way I jump around, it's ridiculous. When I was in the Navy, you believe me in the Navy, I used to get seasick on the ferry, and people, 
the, 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 the people on the ship used to, on the ferry ship used to say, you're going to protect us, you're going to war. It was very embarrassing, but, but when we, all of a sudden, the blanket order came down. Pee Wee and I were in our glory down in Norfolk then, and the blanket order, all athletes overseas. Now, they didn't teach us anything but how to make our bed. And I know over there you didn't have to make a bed where we were going, because they gave me all clothes that were uh, camouflaged. They gave me a bag that had a rifle in it with all these rounds of ammunition, which I gave away on board ship. I found out I could have been court-martialed for that later on. <laughs> so we're walking to the gangplank. I got my sea bag on my shoulder, and I see a phone over there, and a line is being held up. And speaking of lines, as I jump around again, I made up my mind I would never stand in another line again when I got out of the service. I don't know what that's got to do with the story, but <laughs> I got... I got to the phone, I called Cora up, I said, listen, Cora, I got a chance to go over the hill. I said, they're going to uh, New Guinea and the Philippines, and I don't want to go. And she, <laughs> and she said, and she said, again, oh, it's gone, we got about two more minutes. And she said, if you go, I won't be here when you, well, no, it wasn't quite that strong. But she said, if you go, you don't go with my blessings. So I went back on ship, and again, it was a great thing because I didn't get killed over there, and I, I got seasick every day. Just one quick story. I was on board ship. <laughs> I was on board ship for 30 days. I was sick for 30 days. I, they found out I had chronic seasickness. One day, the plane's flying overhead, and the siren goes, to your battle stations. I didn't move. The captain came and said, you get up there, you get court-martialed. I said, that'd be the best thing I happened. That'll throw me overboard. <laughs> so they put me off the ship, but unfortunately, it was in New Guinea. I thought I'd see a lot of Italians there, but that's not what that... <laughs> I'm gonna... Who's gonna pull me off of here? Well, wait a minute. Well, no, no I, I played with and against the greatest. I mean, that era of baseball was absolutely the best. Now it's great for the monies they're paying now. I mean, I'd like to play just one year now, but... Uh, um, but... Oh, wait a minute. No, no, that's, <clears throat> no you, you figure the teams, the team that I mentioned, and Ted Williams and those great teams, and uh, played against Jimmy Fox and Hank Greenberg, and I mean, all those great players, and... and I mean, it's baseball to me, it's been my whole life. I mean, I, it's, thank God for baseball. No strike! No strike! No you know, I got a note here about Joe DiMaggio and Lefty Gomez teaching me about room service. They taught, I never knew you could go in a room, pick up the phone and order room service and get your food sent up. And now I do it all the time. I mean, I never get downstairs. I tried it with Cora after we came home, but she wouldn't, she didn't, uh, no room service. But I do, still on that, I, I've got to, I've got to mention, I've got to get these flies out of here, I got to, I want to introduce my bride, Cora Rizzuto, right there, come on. I mean, like Steve said, well, you're away on these long road trips. We had three-week road trips back then. One of the kids would have the measles. I wouldn't be there. Another one would fall off a bike and get stitches in their chin. I wasn't there. And one of the ones, my oldest daughter, Patricia Rizzuto. Patricia. <clears throat> and then the next one is Cindy. Cynthia Rizzuto. Cindy. And then Penny. Penny Rizzuto. And then the apple of my eye, Scooter. There he is. And Scooter's wife, Ann. Jennifer, Patty's daughter, one of my granddaughters. And that little Huckleberry right in the front, Margaret Carolina. All right, this is it. Oh, no, wait a minute, I got... 
I forgot my whole career as an announcer. But, but I think that's, that's best forgotten, because Howard Cosell told me the first week, he says, you'll never last. He says, you look like George Burns and you sound like Groucho Marx. <laughs> so 38 years later, I'm doing it my way and still here in broadcasting, but I... And they were right. I says, I, you don't hear the score too often or the game too often, but I think all my friends who uh, like to have their name mentioned in the restaurants, where I get a free meal, White, White knows that I do it that way. And, but I mean, I enjoy the game like that, and that's why I was blessed with having, just like I had great partners on the radio, as part, you know, as my broadcast partners. Mel Allen, I started with, and of course, the guy who I did the greatest with and felt more at ease with, had more fun with, was White. White was over there. He was introduced before. He didn't leave, did he? White. There, there he is. But I mean, really, you're great now with, I got Mercer. Took me a while to learn that Oklahomese language, but now he's got it down pat, and he's an excellent, excellent broadcaster. You know, it's a funny thing. Mercer and Mandel both came up as shortstops. You know, when, when Mickey came up, now this is ridiculous. I'm going from the end of my career back to the, you know, when Mandel came up, I had my bags packed. Because I had heard about Mandel, he could outrun a rabbit and hit the ball out of the moon, over the moon. <laughs> over the moon. And I had won the MVP that year before. And I, I, had, I really thought they'd trade me. But I saw Mickey trying to field grounders. He and Mercer were the same. As soon as I saw them trying to field grounders, and they had to clear the, in back of the first baseman, I had to get all the people out of the stands because they were hitting them. So they put Mickey in the outfield. He never played the outfield. They gave him a pair of sunglasses. He put him down too quick. The first ball hit to him, hit him right on the head. But he turned out to be a pretty outstanding outfielder. What a ball player. Why, he could have won every award if he had two good legs. Well, I'm on the last page. <laughs> what? No, no. Wait a minute. Take my time. <laughs> no, really, you, you people have me, but I'm... All right. I mean, I... I mean, I'd stay, I'd stay up out here all day if my voice was good. No kidding. Why don't all you Huckleberries go, go back to hotel? <laughs> Pee Wee's the first one to jump up. No, if you want to let these old timers go back to the hotel, go ahead and I'll just talk to the kids. Anybody wants to leave out there, go ahead. I'll... Benjamin Barrett. I'll tell you, they take too many foul balls in the mask. That's where the... Oh, here they come. George Graham. No, no, seriously, um, I, gotta, I better not. But um, oh yeah, oh I got them coming up on the last page. I got one now. This real dear friend of mine, Ruby Sabatino. Now you know that ends in a vowel. Any name that ends in a vowel, I'll give a birthday to. I'm gonna wish her. A happy birthday and get well soon, because Ruby's a little under the weather, she couldn't make the trip. And the cannolis came last night and this morning. A day without cannolis is like a day without sunshine. All right, I gotta get off here. If one of you guys would just come and drag me physically off, I just, I, no, really, I just wanna say, I have been the luckiest man in the world. I talked about my family, I talked about my baseball career, Broadcasting is, is really, I'm, I'm embarrassed to get my paycheck. Not too embarrassed, I'll go and get it, but it's, it's 
such an easy job. I mean, these guys, White and uh, Mercer and Olden and Siva. I mean, see, unbelievable with Siva. He should be someplace, and he's sitting up here. He should be out broadcasting games. He could be the commissioner or the president of the American League or the National League. No, I'm telling you, he, he is a lot like White. They think things out before they say them. Now, my bride again told me that the reason I get in so much trouble, when you get a thought, you're supposed to travel through your brain, you got a little trap door back here, and then you say, should I or shouldn't I? Okay, and you drop the chair. She says, my trap door is open constantly, so whatever I say comes out before I can think about it. And, and that's how I do get in trouble. But I, I, I really, the, the, the broadcast partners I have had, Mel Allen, the greatest, the voice of the Yankees, right on down the line, every one of them that, and all the ball players I played with, all the teammates I had, without them, I, we wouldn't have gotten all those. I mean, after the DiMaggio era and the Henrik and Burrow, we had the Mantle, the Bauer, the Woodlings, and uh, Yogi, and uh, who else? I mean, we, I mean, we had, oh, on third base, wait a minute. All my third basemen had to be alert for any ball hitting a hole. I try to teach these young kids today, ball hitting a hole, backhanded, throw it to the third baseman, let him throw the guy out. Of course, you know, you got that run going away and, and, and the same way with the second baseman. But Brown, Dr. Bobby Brown, who's leaving the American League um, presidency in a little while, was at third. He had the great arm, Billy Johnson had a great arm. Andy Carey, another one who had a great arm. Gil McDougal, they were all. And McDougal, outstanding ball player, could play any position in the Hall of Fame. What? What do you say? Oh, he wants me to get out of here, right? <laughs> Oh, Cleet Boy. Well, I didn't play with Cleet Boy. Cleet, no, Cleet Boy is not dead. <laughs> do, you, do you hear the, um, when Bob Uecker came into the stadium, who did he tell it? Uecker came into the stadium, he saw him and he was mad. He said, I thought you were dead. I said, I'm not dead. He said, I sent your card, send it back to me. No, listen. One, one, one thing I want to do, and no, I don't want to hear any booze on this now. A man who wants to win so badly that, and has been so wonderful, my family and myself, and all the Yankee ball players, I just want to say thanks, George Steinbrenner. Thank you very much for all you. And I don't say that because I lead the league in days. I have had more days, and always George comes through. As a matter of fact, I was supposed to have a day on August the 13th. The strike came up, and I said, hot dogs, I won't have a day. George moved the day to the ninth. So now we're going to have another day for me. But let me, let me just read this. I just want to, this is the only thing that I put down that I wrote, wrote down. I want to thank all of you who have been. I see now. I don't want to start. I don't want to start crying now. Everybody comes up here and cries. I know it's it's not too bad if you do cry, but you know all of you have been there for the most wonderful lifetime that one man can possibly have. And I just want to say, God bless all of you, and God bless this wonderful game that they call baseball. Thank you very much.